for-profit company called Conservation Metrics, and we're based in Santa Cruz. <coughs> um, and my, um, you know, from a young age, I've been a birder. I've been just just obsessed with birds since I was like four, and all the other kind of creatures on the planet. Um, and um, you know, one of the things that worried me in my during my PhD, I'm a behavioral ecologist, is the the rapid loss of species. This is graphs showing. Um, extinction rates, known extinctions of vertebrates, different vertebrate classes, um, and then uh, estimate uh, an estimate of like what normal background rates of extinctions are, that dotted line down there. Um, and you can see that there's a huge uptick in extinction since we, well, since Europeans started to explore more widely in the world. Um, and then since the Industrial Revolution, um, you have uh, huge increases in the amount of um, extinctions in vertebrates. And these are the most studied species. So then you start to think about all the insects and um, other uh, biodiversity that we can't count and measure that easily. And so, you know, what's driving our work is there's limited amounts of money in conservation. Where should we be spending it? Um, what problems um, should we be trying to tackle? What methods should we be funding? What methods are effective? Um, and how can we improve each one of these? Because all of our conservation tools can be improved. And um, we're really focused on evidence-based uh, approaches to conservation. And one of the key bits here is monitoring, right? The key bit of that evidence-based based cycle here is to monitor your resources, figure out when something's gone wrong, um, do an action, measure how effective you were, and then start on your cycle again. And so monitoring is a key part at several um, parts of this, of this adaptive management cycle. And animals are hard to monitor. It's often difficult to find them. And when you actually have really well-trained biologists and ecologists go out in the field to do it, it's labor-intensive, it's expensive, it's intrusive. And you can only be there for short periods of time, especially in like the most remote places. Um, and in recent years, um, we've had an explosion of consumer kind of electronic advance that you guys understand well here in Palo Alto. Um, and it's driven, it's, it's trickled down into our space where we have huge advances in the acoustic um, uh, sensor, um, sensors that are available for conservationists um, and visual stuff. The problem has become how do you deal with the data? Um, and um, both of us are dealing with the data. We're doing slightly different things. We have been working um, since 2013 on um, using deep learning, basically. And so what we're interested in is um, actually trying to find specific signals, specific species in that whole um, loud soundscape. Um, so it's, it's the opposite end of this. There's all the sound in a healthy community, and then there are the sounds produced by the, the species of interest. And so we've been using deep learning to do that both on the sound side and on the visual side. Um, and some of the advantages of these automated approaches to, to wildlife monitoring are that it's more cost effective, it's much less invasive than putting teams of people out into these um, sensitive places, it's more repeatable, right? Um, and it's archivable, so the data that you get you can store it and you can hit it in 100 years with new technologies to ask new questions. Um, and one of the things that's also great is that you can increase your temporal and your spatial scale of your surveys. So you can do a lot more surveying and what that does statistically is it helps you, um, it's, it helps you be able to differentiate between before and after. It helps you say conclusively um, with statistical power that there's been a change of some kind. And we at Conservation Metrics basically work with folks in government, around the world, um, uh, foundations, NGOs, and we do four kinds of things mainly. One is help people find rare and elusive species. The use of these technologies allows you to find things that are hiding and are very rare because you can blanket the place with, with surveys. Um, for some species, we can actually track population trends through time. Not all, but some. Um, we do before and after measurements, before and after uh, a management action or before and after a, an event occurs like a selective logging. Um, and then we do some uh, work on the, um, the interactions with um, the built environment. So 
there's interaction between wildlife and the built environment. And I think, actually, I'll stop there. I have more slides, but I think this tells um, you what we do. We've been running for about eight years now, and um, we're, we've done hundreds of projects around the world, um, mostly in acoustics. And so I'll stop there, and we can do our, our uh, panel discussion and, and open more questions. Uh, thanks, Matthew. That was that was great. So, Susanna, do you want to come up here? Do you want to sit or stand? I, I'm fine standing. Okay. Yeah. Switch this off. Well, overviews of your work and the sector generally. So, um, beyond, beyond what you're doing specifically, um, how widely used is bioacoustics in this conservation space? Um, it's grown dramatically since I started working in it in 2000. Six or whatever. Um, so it's grown dramatically. There's been advances in hardware development, and then there's um, advances in the approaches. So it's um, it is mainstream now. Like uh, when I when we when I first started, it was the early adopter stage of life, um, and now it's mainstreamed and um, widely available. I think. I, I agree, and I I'm for example very new to it. I only started using bioacoustics about three or four years ago. So I think I am I am the evidence of this explosion of bioacoustics, basically. Um, and so when you're doing a bioacoustics project, what are some of the challenges that you face? I mean, some of the more funny challenges are just having the microphone eaten by different animals. <laughs> Sometimes it's little insects that chew on the foam that covers the microphones. Other times it can be bigger animals playing with the recorders. For example, we had an orangutan experimenting with whether it can open the recording. But in general, I think the biggest challenge is basically the analysis. Because it's easy enough. Like anybody could go in a forest or anywhere and record even with their phone all the sounds. But then the question is how to analyze it in a meaningful and useful way. So I think that's the biggest challenge right now. I would agree. I think the analysis is a challenge um, to this scaling. I think um, one of the things that's interesting is you do still need to go to these really rare locations to place a device. That device can be there for much longer periods of time, but you still need to pay people who know what's going on um, to go to those places. And so that's a cost, um, although it is it's cheaper than sending people there every year. Um, so that's a cost. One of the other challenges that we have other than analysis is actually just shipping data around. Um, we're collecting huge amounts of data. Um, one of the projects we're working on right now, um, and we're working, we got some funding from Microsoft. They have a program called AI for Earth. Um, and we're working with a program called the Elephant Listening Project. And they are working with forest elephants in um, the Republic of Congo. And these are elephants that we don't know a lot about because they're hidden in underneath the canopy of like the second largest rainforest in the world. And, um, and so they make noises so you can listen to them. And um, our partners have created a, a grid of 50 acoustic sensors that are in this um, protected area. And it takes them 30 days to visit each one of the sensors and replace the batteries and collect the data from the SD card. Then the data comes to us, and that takes a month to get mailed to us. Then it takes us a few days to upload it into the cloud. And then it takes us a week to actually process it um, with just computer time. And then after that, we can start to work with it. And so there is this data chain that I think is a, a challenge um, that we all face, um, and especially in the places we really want to work, which is like where there aren't good, uh, band there's a lot of bandwidth. Uh, so being in Silicon Valley, um, of course, there are probably a lot of tech, I tech ideas to helping address some of these issues. And so, um, uh, you know, just on the deployment, I mean, do you see opportunities for things like drones in certain circumstances with deploying devices? And then um, on the data side, um, there's a group here in San Francisco called Rainforest Connection. And what they've done is they've basically taken cell phones, put a solar array around it, and then they mount it in the forest canopy. The idea, I mean, there's many reasons for that, but one of the things you get um, is if you're within 20 kilometers of a 
of a cell phone tower, you can actually create uh, you, you can create a network device, and so then theoretically you could stream this um, uh, the data to a, a, to the cloud and then process it that, that way. So I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on on new technology and how that might help address some of the the, the scalability issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what Rainforest Connection is doing is really cool because being able to see and hear the data as it comes in, that's for me really exciting. At the same time, like Matthew was saying, it's not always feasible. For example, one of my sites in Papua New Guinea, I had to walk for three days to get there. Mm -hmm. So there's no way there would be a cell phone tower in 20 kilometers. Um, but I think deploying with the drones, I'm not sure if that will be easy. But picking up the data with drones is something that I th think might be really interesting. Because during the deployment, you need to pay attention of like where the microphone is pointing, whether it's not like it's being hit by a leaf that's going, that you're going to then constantly hear. But the data pickup might be something interesting. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there for the data pickup. I think there is some potential for dropping off or having some clever crazy thing that has mesh on it and just sits in the canopy for a few days in one location and then picks up and moves. Because one of the other challenges is, you know, in, again, in terms of statistics, like the more places you can actually sample, the better you're going to understand what's happening. And one of our limitations is these things cost money and it costs money to go to them. And so if you can have a thing that's moving around, that's pretty interesting. There's lots of technical challenges with that. But that's something I thought. Um, there are some devices that are going around and, and picking up data or um, uh, retrieving data from devices. So that's a really cool opportunity. And then the other cool space is the edge detection space, which again, there's a lot of interactions with this Internet of Things world that um, may be familiar to people here in, in Palo Alto. But if you can actually um, detect an event of interest or a, a soundscape measure of some value, um, and then actually not have to send all the acoustic data back, but just send an SMS text message that says an event of interest occurred, then that um, can be pretty valuable. However, running these models in the field, um, these models are, our models are quite complex. They're, um, they're, they take a lot of power to run, and so that edge space isn't available yet. It's the thing that people really want. Um, but it, that's the cutting edge, and so I've, that's something that we're really interested in, too. So that would be issues like threat de detection, so like gunshots, chainsaws, things like that? Yeah, I mean, so in terms of order of like who would spend money, why, is it worth spending money on this? Threats are the big ones. So poaching, um, resource extraction, incursion um, questions, um, then the next one is like biosecurity issues. So if you have invasive species on islands, detecting the fact that a cat has been dropped off on an island early is probably a really good thing. Um, and so those are those are the spaces where that's really immediately relevant. In the long term, and actually if you can have reliable models working in the field, then you can reduce your cost of sending maintenance teams out, right? And so in the long term, I think it's valuable for all of these questions. In the short term, it's really valuable for the anti-poaching stuff. And so as we get better internet co connectivity with some of these new satellite systems going up, um, you know, would there be potential to do that processing in, in the cloud or having it, having it on a chip or something like that so to help address that issue? Um, yeah, so we are working on that, yes. So yes, so hopefully. Um, what we're working on now, um, again with, with help with Microsoft, is actually having models and model libraries running in the cloud. And so these are these are models that are tuned to detect calls of a particular species. Or sometimes we have we're working on a, a 500 class model, a nice round number um, uh, that will allow you to detect things that are like the signals in these the 500 species that we've that we've selected. And so I think in the future, um, having those cloud-based things will be, will be good. I think um, right now, practically, it's very expensive to be running all of this in the cloud for conservation, um, unless you have some support. Um, so I mean, a lot of this sounds great, but are there downsides to this uh, in terms of 
you know, if we start to monitor these soundscapes, could uh, could there be un unintended consequences? Yeah, I, I my biggest fear about this is that we record these really rich soundscapes and then I play them or I make them publicly available. And what about somebody who's really interested in hunting that particular species? Mm. How about if it's like a, the, for example, the hornbill that I played to you, that species can, if somebody tracks it down and sells it for traditional Chinese medicine because of its really cool horn, they can earn like several months of salary that they would otherwise get in a regular job. So the incentive to hunt species is really huge. And the way you hunt some of these species is that you play back their sound to attract them. So that's my biggest fear that we might be providing material for poachers. And so I think it's important to think of these risks in advance and basically where there are these kind of sensitive species, not give specific locations, like specific coordinates, kind of maybe just give a generic um, area so that people can be like, okay, here there was a hornbill yesterday, I'm gonna go rush and try to, to hunt it. Because these species are like going extinct because of hunting. Yeah, um, I, I agree on that. The security side of it is really important. And um, I know that, um, that people have hacked into databases for con of conservationists to find rhinoceros and to find other species. So that's a really big issue. Um, I think another one is um, it's really exciting to be using these new technologies. Um, and again, it's really easy to invest a whole bunch of money in this thing that seems to be the promise of the future um, and not think through how you're going to use it. And so I'm, sometimes it seems small, but some groups we've worked with um, have spent a lot of money, invested a lot of money in this technology and these, and these approaches, and haven't really spent the same amount of time or money on figuring out how to um, set up their, their study so that they can actually answer questions. And so sometimes there's a little bit of money wasted. It's a small thing, but that is a thing I think that we need to think about. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of things that don't make noise. Um, you know, noise is really cool, it's amazing. It doesn't solve all problems. Great. Um, I wanted to um, offer the audience an uh, opportunity to ask questions. So, uh, does anyone want to uh, ask any questions? I have a question for Dr. Anna. So, I saw that you have a soundscape analysis that looks a lot like candlesticks track on a or stock market. Uh, could you explain to me how that works, like the, all the ranges and the dots and candles? Oh, on that one graph? Yes. Yeah, so it's actually pretty simple. There is, it looks like a box for each day and in the box in the middle of it is like a thick black line and that black line shows the median so kind of almost like the average for the day and then the width of the box shows the spread of the data so for example if the box was really really tall we would know that during one minute of the day the forest was really quiet but there was another minute where it was really loud. Whereas if that box was pretty narrow, we know like, well, through, through the whole time, there was like a constant amount of noise. So it just shows it represents you. represents variance? Yes, exactly. And it, it shows you kind of like the, you can pick different ways to see that variance. You could see the first 25% and the top 75% or the whole spread. Um, I think one of the, can we turn the, um, the thing back on for one second. I think one of the really cool things about these data streams is the amount, is the richness of the data we get, and we're we are only touching the surface on. It'll take a second. Okay, so we're only scratching the surface um, in my mind on how to use this data because we get um, we get you can get really fine scale to the second level information over a year at like. 50 sites. So you can really, you can either, you can, you can boil that down into means and variance, or you can start to sort of uncover and wander through this complexity. And I, again, I think we are just, um, we're just starting to learn. So this is, um, this is a graph of 
activity at a seabird colony in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef for a whole breeding season. And you can see here on the y-axis is the amount of calls, how loud it is, how many birds are calling. And you can see that like we got there too late, the birds had already come in the early part of the season. Um, then they, the courtship occurs. Okay, cool. Courtship occurs, um, they leave to go, it, it takes a lot of energy to produce this egg, they all depart the colony, then they come back and there's all this activity from non-breeders that are there and all these dips that are related to the moon. When it's a full moon, no one wants to go to the colony because there's eagles around, right? And so that's one way of looking at this. This is a pretty, um, it's a two-dimensional way of looking at it. It's really cool for me, right? Um, it's for the laser. <laughs> oh, okay, so then hit the next one. Um, so this is another way of looking at those same data. Now, the heat coming out of here is the intensity of call. So like red is a lot more calling activity. Um, the y-axis is now bins of minutes from sunrise, and then the x-axis is the same thing, the, like the season. And what you can see there is that blob that's courtship, and then they leave the colony, and then they come back. And all this activity is occurring right as dawn is occurring, the first light is occurring, and that's causing all of these seabirds to start calling, and there's this huge intensity, but they're calling throughout the night. And so these, like again, this is, this is just scratching the surface of the amount of data we have and comparing these things year on year in the face of climate change, what's happening? Are these, is this whole breeding season getting stretched or is it getting contracted or is it getting truncated? How do you, what's the activity like year on year? So th there's a lot of really amazing data in here that we're, again, just starting to look at. So you said that they're going extinct because of hunting. Is it more hunting or climate change? Pushing or climate change? Mm, is that the question about the specific bills. species, like the hornbills? Generally, generally. Generally. Yeah, so there are a lot of species that suffer from habitat loss, from like cutting the forest down. They literally need the forest to survive. They need to make a nest there, they need the food and so on. And then the hunting is for specific species. I don't know what the exact percentage is right now for species that are threatened by hunting and by uh, habitat loss. But basically, especially in Southeast Asia where I've been working, a lot of birds are targeted for hunting, either for their body parts, like these hornbills for the, for the horn, or even as pets. So people keep a lot of birds in cages at home and they even subscribe them to singing competitions. They really appreciate the sound of the birds, but then, you know, they capture them from wild and then keep them. So it's basically both. And the problem is that as we're losing the habitat and we're taking animals out of the habitat and then whatever is left is changing because of climate change, it's like a triple threat that, that's right. really, really hard to control. And, and, and you, Matthew, you work on islands, so it's yeah. even a different issue. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. So I work on islands a lot, um, and so um, we have a lot of invasive species on islands, so that's something that it's like these species, these communities have evolved in the absence of um, vertebrate predators, mostly, mammalian predators. And in our exploration phase, um, we started to leave a lot of rats, cats, goats, pigs, um, et cetera, on islands. And these things have devastated um, uh, insular communities as well as insects and diseases. But that's another big threat is um, invasive species, both on continents, but it's more easily seen on islands. But then again, I think I really, I think there's no, it's, it's not useful to think of the one main cause. I think that the triple threat or the quintuple threat is really a big issue and what we've done is we've created islands of habitat where there used to be continents of habitat and now you're stuck on this island and when climate change occurs you can't move because there's no other habitat available within your your ability to move and so that I think is the long-term threat from climate change among others but that's one big one. Um, with in, in terms of an ability to potentially inform policy, mm -hmm. um, is, and you said you have a for-profit, mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, just curious if that impacts your ability to inform policy and also what the steps would be in terms of going from the research, the data, to being able to have an impact that way. Um, so I would say that I don't think having a for-profit is affecting that ability. That's our goal. Um, you know, and so we did it on purpose, like trying to be a for-profit in the conservation space. It was like very conscious, like, can we make this happen? Um, and our whole point is to inform policy. So our whole point is to take information, sorry, sorry, take data and turn it into information for policymakers to take action. And, um, and so one of the problems with the previous way of doing that is that traditional monitoring methods um, are expensive and like noisy. Like you were, I'm just there for two weeks in June rather than being there all year. And if one year there's a drought, and the next year there's a hurricane, and the next year it's normal weather, you have very huge variation in what you would measure in that place. And so informing policy is quite difficult because you just say, well, I don't know. It was really low, then it was really high, and now it's in the middle, right? And so by being there across the landscape, across all these different periods, you actually get better data and hopefully can inform policy better. And we, um, we work on a project in, in Hawaii um, that involves birds colliding with power transmission lines, a very rare event that's very difficult to measure. Um, we can hear that sound. We now have transformed our understanding of how many collisions occur. And now you have this thing that was super rare on the landscape once a month at any one site on an island, but every night there's lots of collisions. Now we can actually measure that. We can, we can then turn that into policy and say, well, the, a lot of the collisions are occurring at sites where the poles are above canopy, they are the six, six lines that are on top of each other rather than in parallel, there's a static line on top of all these different factors. And so we've already um, been working with the utility to get rid of some power um, transmission lines and to transform different transmission lines to reduce collision risk. And so that's a project where we've done that cycle um, for, an endangered, for two endangered species. So for-profit business, what um, what conservation interests will be served because somebody has the money to pay for your services, and which ones will be neglected because they don't? Yeah, that's uh, a really good question, and um, and it it also touches on the scalability question, right? Like so, right now we're a funnel. Like people send us data, we process it, and then it comes out the other end. And the people who can afford um, to work with us, and, and we can afford to work with. Um, like it's both ways, um, are um, mostly in northern, like in the diff in northern countries, right? So uh, a lot of projects in the U.S. or in Australia, um, and so who's neglected is um, small groups in Sumatra trying to figure out what's going on with orang orangutans, right? And so that model is it is not like the current model is not great um, for that. And so our hope is to um, help develop more tools that can be actually used by a wider group of people. So tool making rather than um, services. And so I think we were talking about this before we are talking and uh, before we, we um, spoke. And so I think that's a big challenge. I think it's a big challenge across conservation. Um, and we are acutely aware of it and trying to figure out how we, how we make that happen. Just to follow up on that. So, but you, you might have a foundation in, in North America that might fund a project in Indonesia, is that correct? Correct. We have a lot of foundations that, yeah, that will fund projects around the world. We have uh, projects in uh, 26 countries or something. Mm -hmm. So, yes. And um, and we do pro bono work, and we, I mean, <laughs> we, we, uh, uh, we, we certainly struggle, right, as a small business. Um, but I think there's a bigger point there of, like, um, these technologies are available right now to a smaller subset. Um, the, there are cool devices that are being developed. There's, a, there's an acoustic sensor that's called the Audio Moth. It costs $60, $50, $60, as opposed to $800, which is what the, um, the, the good commercial um, sensors cost. And um, it's open source, so people can monkey with the firmware, um, print their own boards. And so I think that's really interesting, and so we are interested in um, the ability to open source models, etc. cetera. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that area. Just a quick follow-up, so um, on the business side, so is there growing demand for 
your services? Yeah, there there is growing demand, um, and uh, it, the the scale of surveys are growing, like that elephant survey, like in, it, the scale of surveys and the number of folks who are jumping on board is growing. So yes, there is, but um, again, it's not a huge market, right? So w one of our challenges, um, I was speaking to some folks before, is um, hiring the best talent. We have enterprise level data challenges, but we are mom and pop coffee shop level revenue, right? And so, so that, um, that disparity is another challenge. We face really big challenges. So partnering with smart folks who are interested in what we do, um, partnering with really smart people in academia and foundations and et cetera is, um, is the way we move forward. And so this is on the business side for you. What are some of the types of land use that you're looking at for the soundscape questions? Uh, for now, I've been looking at, or I'm hoping to look at any land use type that's to do with forests, because I think acoustics is especially suited for, for tropical forests. If you use the sensors in a very open habitat, like a savanna or other types of grassland, it's less great because there can be a lot of wind. So in terms of tropical forests, I've been working in areas that have been locked by big industrial logging of timber extraction operations. And then the other thing that's interesting is looking at forests that have been protected as a part of these zero deforestation commitments. So if you have a big company that says, or that commits to decreasing its footprint on, on the environment, they might uh, commit or pledge to protect a particular area of a forest. But whether they are just protecting the forest really on paper, or whether it's like kind of an almost empty forest with just trees but no animals, that's something that we could get at use, uh, by using bioacoustics. I mean, what about oceans? Uh, oceans. <laughs> so actually the, the use of bioacoustics in oceans has a much longer history than on the, on the land. Um, I think it's because of basically use in, in like, as a part of even navigation. So there's been a lot more done on the individual species recognition, like working on whale behavior and, and things like that. And now marine soundscapes and also freshwater soundscapes are really becoming a popular topic. So I've recently listened to one of my colleagues' recordings from a stream in Myanmar and I had no idea that like freshwater invertebrates are making sounds. It sounds like some kind of alien sounds. <laughs> I've heard some of those from Australia. Yeah, that these aquatic soundscapes are really interesting. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of work uh, that's been done. Some of it related to listening for submarines. So like we, the U.S., had a bunch of listening devices underwater, listening for Russian submarines, and you happen to pick up a lot of whales, and so. That kind of jump started a bunch of stuff, and I think we were again talking before uh, before we started. One of the really cool things about marine soundscapes, especially like coral reef soundscapes, is um, there's a lot of evidence, experimental evidence, that shows that you know coral um, are eggs and they have a larval form where they float around as plankton, and they've shown a, a, there's a number of experiments that show that like if you play them the sound of a healthy reef system, they will start to swim towards it with all their cilia. And it's really crazy because like how are they hearing this? I guess they have a lot of hairs. But like coral will drop out, um, larval fish will drop out when they hear a reef and then they have a higher chance of actually recruiting to the reef if it sounds good. And then um, another a number of other invertebrates, um, crabs and shrimp. And then oysters will do the same thing in temperate waters. And so they're using sound as a cue. So therefore we're on to something, right? Um, and so I think that's really cool. Are there more questions from the audience? Um, especially like in countries like Global South, what kind of infrastructure is needed for these kind of automated um, monitoring kind of projects? Uh, I think it depends a lot on what exactly is the goal. If the goal is just to survey a large area of forest and see where is the most biodiverse spot, you could literally just turn up, like I turn up with 30 recorders and then work with 
whoever wants to work with me locally and we deploy the recorders and then we collect them. But if you want to set up something more long term where the devices will transmit the data to like through like a cellular network or something like that, that requires I guess more infrastructure and you need to be able to charge the devices. They usually have rechargeable batteries. So I guess electricity is really useful. Yeah. There is a lot of work that's been done on trying to include solar panels that can connect to the devices. But honestly, in a rainforest, you have to then climb the tree yeah. <laughs> to put the, the solar panels up, which slows things down yeah. a lot. So I think it's yeah, it varies a lot on what exactly you want. But I think that's the exciting thing, that we can use it at least at the kind of basic way, no matter what. I think I would say uh, computer power and storage for the analysis side. And so you often need GPUs or um, computers with a lot of cores and RAM. Um, and then storage is the big issue. Right? A lot of people were storing all these data on hard drives in a ca filing cabinet or a drawer somewhere. And those data are super valuable. And how do we figure out how we can work together to collect those data in some organized fashion from across the world so that we can use them in perpetuity and learn new things from them? Um, I'm, I'm a composer, and I've been spending the last few years actually doing a lot of field recording and working with scientists who do what you guys are doing to try to find ways to creatively teach the public about this. Um, so this is really close to my heart, this topic, and um, one thing that I've thought a lot about is uh, how to, when the, in education projects or outreach projects, with things like plastic and straws, you can say to the public, like, hey, don't use those anymore, but with this, it's really hard on an individual basis to make much of a difference, and I'm just wondering if you guys have thought about that, because I know there are some, also there are a lot of projects where you can involve citizen science, but this is a little bit more challenging that way. I mean, not everybody can get a hydrophone and drop it in the water and, yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if that's some, a consideration. For me, it definitely is, and that's one of the things that I find really cool about Soundscapes, uh -huh. that it's really easy to explain to people look, this is a forest that doesn't have any sounds, <laughs> and people like hearing animals. So I've done a lot of talks and lessons in high schools, for example, where students can even analyze their own soundscapes, and we have some free online lessons um, that schools can just use anywhere. And with the citizen science, I think I'll let you talk about that more, because I, but there are, there are already people who are doing that. Yeah. Um so I think there is this intuitiveness to it, like we could hear that difference. So it's just the how you get that, how you get that to people, like what's the medium you use. But I think it's actually this thing that's actually hardwired in us. So I think that's pretty cool and a and a thing we should figure out better how to use. Um, in terms of citizen science, like one, I think a really good example. Well, there's several, but one really good example is in in the UK. Um, you can sign up to monitor bats, um, and they will send you like an acoustic recording device, instructions on how to do it, um, and all this stuff, and then you put it out in your neighborhood, and then there's ways to get the data back to the central place, and then they're really good at distributing what happened, like what the results were. And so there's a lot of people who are not bat biologists who are doing really cool work. Um, in the US, there's other citizen scientists, things like that, they, they actually have a bar, like you have to understand a little bit more about bats. Um, to be part of it, but there's a lot of those. I think the other side is um, on um, helping to process these data, and there are a number of um, websites out there where people can upload their projects and have camera trap images or sounds, or what we use are called spectrograms, which is like a graph of a sound. Um, and you can have people go through and help you identify things and train models. So those are citizen science things, but I think the the sound, like the, how it's hardwired in us, I think is really powerful. And the last thing I'd say is there's a new group called the Society for, what is it, the Ecoacoustics Society. And there, it's a really cool new scientific society, but it has this component that's like a third of the folks are artists. And so 
it's a bunch of nerdy scientists and then like cool artists. And so there's a lot of graphs and then we'll pause for a, uh, an environmental composition. So it's a pretty cool new uh, scientific group. So I can talk to you about them. Can I just add one thing that I thought of that I find that soundscapes are also easy to use when you're talking to people who don't speak or, or that I don't speak their language. So for example, when I was doing recordings in Papua New Guinea, where I really don't, don't understand the local languages, when we were then playing back the sounds to people who were even helping us record them or just people who were interested, they could tell us then in a book, like, oh, that was the species. Even though we couldn't really talk about what to have for lunch, we could talk about bird species <laughs> by using soundscapes. So I think that's, for me, that's really powerful also. Uh, I, I was just wondering, in the, in the threat area, uh, is there, do you, are there actually examples of deployment of uh, acoustic sensors for protecting full preserves or parks or mixing with camera traps, or is that sort of waiting for the real-time analysis and data challenges? I think the best example um, is Rainforest Connection at the moment, and their goal initially was to listen for chainsaws, right? And so they're getting the data out. Um, they also listen for engines and other things. Um, the, the guys who developed the open acoustic device, the, the audio moth it's called, they actually um, have uh, put a, a gunshot detector on that, but they're, at the moment there's no outside communication, so you've got to go back and get it. Um, and then finally there are a couple of other folks who are working on camera traps that also have microphones, um, and this is new, and they, um, I can talk to you about them, I think, I forget the name right now. Um, of their company right now. But they have actually made some good inroads in real-time poacher detection of people, uh, vehicles, and then sounds of those things and gunshots. So, um, and we are trying to work in that space on detecting invasive species arrival on an island, so biosecurity. Um, and then the gunshot question. The problem is in these forests where a lot of the gunshot is of, of major interest, you have huge branches breaking off and it sounds just like a gunshot and then you have huge thunderstorms coming through that don't sound just like a gunshot but will often trip up our models and so it is it is there's no really there's no solution out of the box but there's a lot of people working on it. Oh, sorry I was gonna say rainforest connection had a funny story about uh, there's some insect I think in uh, I think it's in the Amazon. It sounds just like a chainsaw. <laughs> the only reason, the only way they could distinguish was uh, the length of the call. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but just to, because we keep talking about how bad it is not being able to upload the data because there is no whatever network. Actually, I, there are also protected areas that are using bioacoustics and camera traps to listen to the gunshots and see the poachers. And even though they can only get the data next month, they can then analyze where exactly do the poachers usually come. And for example, when I was in Gabon a couple of weeks ago and talking to people who were doing this study, they said, yeah, we found out that people go hunting uh, the week before their paycheck comes because that's when they run out of money and they want to get some extra income. Mm -hmm. So then they were able to target the patrols during that time in that particular place. Yeah, we're, I totally agree. There is value in understanding what happened a little while ago, because there's humans are habit, we, we have a lot of habits, right? And so it's, it's in terms of designing, figuring out where your security is. So yeah, totally, that's um, exactly right. And the Forest Elephant Project, we detect gunshots, but it's gunshots that occurred three months ago. Um, so I think we have time for another question or two. I have a, a, a kind of a frivolous question. So how do you prevent the wildlife from eating your microphones and destroying your devices? So I have a few tested methodologies for that. <laughs> Number one is don't touch the microphone with sweaty hands. Uh, because the, most of the animals that like to eat the foam, they are somehow attracted to the smell of sweat. <laughs> Um, and then we've been experimenting with like little cages around the microphone, but that hasn't exactly worked yet. <laughs> yeah, we, um, I've lost a lot of devices and microphones to crazy creatures. Um, right off here, off of San Francisco, where the islands called this, um, the Farallon Islands, 
Um, and so we, I'm listening and working with a bunch of folks out there uh, looking at these things called ashy storm petrels. There's these really cool, small nocturnal birds that, that nest underground. And the Farallons is full of gulls, and the gulls just love to eat the mics, nest on top of our song, on top of the acoustic sensors. Um, we've also worked on an island called Palmyra in, in sort of the Line Islands in the Central Pacific. And there, there are these really amazing basketball-sized like hermit crabs, but they don't have, there's no shell big enough for them, so they've just gone without the shell. And these huge things, and they just come up and just tear into our devices. So we've tried all manner of cages and putting them up high, and it, these coconut crabs can get to anything. So um, grizzly bears um, will often come up if you put it in a cage. They'll just come up and scratch their back on your <laughs> on your device. So there's a lot of uh, challenges. Um, and the forest elephants, um, they're putting their uh, sensors. Uh, at the height that a forest elephant can't stand on its back legs and grab something. So that's like the exact height that they're putting their sensors at. Uh, great. So I think I'll just ask one more question and then I'll give folks a few minutes to talk with people one-on-one. -on -one. But um, uh, just in terms of you know where we're headed, where, where do you see this sector being in, say, five to ten years? Maybe, um, you know, realistically and then sort of your dream scenario. Um, so I think um, this is growing really rapidly, and, it, and we are going to be able to uh, monitor things at continental scales. And so I think that's both going to be on the soundscape side of things, and then also on the species side of things. And so what I imagine um, is things like the weather forecast, um, or y you've seen these maps, I think, maybe of like spring leafing out in North America and from satellite images and you could just see this green belt moving north um, as spring arrives. It's amazing and just imagine if you had the soundscape with that and so I think we're going to be able to do that. I think people's devices around their homes are going to be, um, people are going to give channel access to say, hey, okay, you can monitor the environment outside my house. I have my security system, why don't you also do your monitoring that you want to do of the environment, and we're going to be able to get those feeds. Um, and so I think it's it's going to be a common, normal part of our um, everyday life. And I I think in my like my dream is that basically in five or ten years, when you buy this wooden shelf, you will be able to go online and listen to the sounds from that forest. And I'm sure Patagonia will purchase wood only from very responsibly managed forests. <laughs> so you'll hear a lot of sounds. So that's the one big thing, to really increase the transparency and the traceability of products that are maybe sourced really far away. And we maybe never get to go there, but we might be assured what's happening on the ground in terms of biodiversity. The other thing that's also my, my second dream this, I think, is about like the last chance we get to understand what are kind of like undisturbed biodiversity baselines in the most remote, the least disturbed areas. Because really time is running out and everything is changing so fast. And I think now we could use soundscapes to get an understanding of what the world in these remote rainforests is in, let's say, 2020. And that might be our last kind of way to, to maybe even pass to the future generations, this is what it was like, these were the species we had. Because we don't have time to go and describe to all of the species even. So that's my two dreams. Great. Well, I want to uh, thank our speakers and also Patagonia for hosting us. And Patagonia is also going to do uh, the results of the raffle. So just want to thank everyone.